Do you ever find yourself when you're on location creating say a focus stack series of images or maybe an exposure blended set of photographs and you're not 100% certain as to whether or not you're actually gonna need these extra images but you do these things just in case, just to be safe. So when you have the images back home, you, you have those photographs uh, at your disposal if you end up needing them. I end up doing the, the same exact thing whenever I'm shooting panos as well. You know, sometimes I'll, I'll shoot maybe a three or a five set uh, pano when I'm on location. And oftentimes I'll get home and I'll use all those images. Sometimes I'll only use a couple of those photographs and sometimes I won't use any of them at all, but I, I do these things on location just to be safe, just in case. But there's a lot more to panoramic photography outside of just creating really wide photographs. And in this video, I wanna share with you the multiple different reasons why you might wanna start shooting more panos, along with the, the, I guess, the quickest and the easiest way to shoot panos when you're on location, the by far best way to do this inside of Lightroom and only using Lightroom, no Photoshop or anything else, Lightroom only, along with the mistakes you want to avoid that could certainly destroy your end result. So as far as the, the multiple reasons why, I think a lot of people believe that Panos is just to create a really wide photograph and sure that is a big part of it, but there's so many different reasons why you might want to start doing more Panos. Obviously, the, the I should say the most obvious reason is because a scene is too large to capture in a single image. So a lot of times you'll create a Pano for that. But sometimes maybe you have a, and this happened to me on my recent trip to Norway, my widest lens was a, was a 23 millimeter prime which is on a medium format camera, it's like the equivalent of, uh, I believe like 18 or maybe 19 millimeters on a full frame, which is wide, but it's not super, super wide. So when you have a, your widest focal length isn't wide enough to capture the scene, maybe then you'll shoot a pano. And a pano doesn't always have to be three or five or nine images. Sometimes it could be just two photographs. Oftentimes I'll use a telephoto lens as well, which obviously is not a wide lens at all. But a lot of times if you zoom all the way into a subject, especially mountains, and it makes those mountains seem more grandiose as opposed to what happens when you use a wide angle lens to mountains, putting on a telephoto lens and sweeping across the landscape and creating a panel that way is, is super beneficial as well. Creating high resolution photographs is another great reason to create a pano. Maybe you can capture the entire scene in a single photograph with a really wide lens, but you could create a couple of, of, of uh, versions of that photograph just moving your camera just a little bit and create one very high resolution photograph. And when you do that, that also gives you the ability to crop in substantially more. So there's a ton of different reasons to pano out there outside of creating, like I mentioned earlier, just those really wide photographs. Now, before we jump right into it, the, uh, before we jump into the, the best way and the different ways to, um, to stitch these together using Lightroom, obviously you wanna know how to create these when you're on location. I'm not gonna dive into this super, super in depth because it's a pretty straightforward process, but the most important thing you wanna do is A, make sure your tripod is perfectly level. Most tripods have a little bubble level somewhere on it. You wanna make sure that that bubble is in the dead center so your tripod is perfectly straight. Put your camera on top of your ball head, make sure your camera is perfectly straight, and then you want to loosen up your ball head so you can swing it left and right, pan it left and right, and then as you, you go all the way to the left, or I guess you could start at the right, wherever you start, it doesn't matter, but look at your histogram, and then slowly start to move your, your camera to the left and to the right, and just make sure that there's not an area of your pano that is gonna have underexposed shadows or an area that's really underexposed, and even more important than that, make sure there's not an area of your pano that is going to be overexposed. So you wanna make sure that everything is con contained, I should say, all that the information is contained within the histogram in that entire sweeping motion of the landscape that you're targeting. So that's very, very important. And then you just start taking those series of photographs. And like I said, it doesn't have to be three, five, or 10 images, you could just do one or two. No matter what it is, you just wanna make sure that you overlap each one of those photographs. Kind of a good rule of thumb is to overlap at least 50%, or I should say 50%, anything more than that might be a little bit of an overkill. But you just wanna make sure that you have enough information that the post-processing software that you're using can easily stitch these images together. So that is definitely the, the, the short story of how to pano, but it's a super simple process. If you've never done it before, you can easily practice in your backyard and uh, just you know make a pano of uh, whatever's in your backyard just to, uh, to practice, but it's a very, very straightforward process. Now, as far as how to stitch these together in Lightroom, there's multiple different ways, and there is definitely ways that work substantially better than others. 
So this is a photograph that I took in Norway recently. This is the, the far left of the pano. This is the center. And you can tell this is the image straight on. And I couldn't capture this. I guess I almost got most of this lake in the image, but I wasn't able to get this rock here at all. And then this is the third image on the right. So one, two, three. So not a gigantic pano, not a five or 10 shot pano, just three photographs. And I overlap even more than 50%. So when I go through these, you can tell that I probably ended up overlapping almost maybe 70% of each one of those uh, photographs, which is a little bit of an overkill, but I didn't need a, a whole lot to, uh, to capture this scene. I just needed a little bit of additional uh, latitude because like I mentioned earlier, the lens I was using wasn't super, super wide. So what you wanna do, so let me just go back to my grid here, open this up, and these are the three images here. This is also a panel I took with a telephoto lens. If I have time, I'll show you this one too, because that came out pretty well. So I'm gonna select all these, and then you can right click and come down here to photo merge, and then select panorama, or when you have all three highlighted, you can come up here to the top, hit photo, and drag this down to photo merge and hit panorama that way. Either way, same result, just two different ways to get there. So you are greeted with this right here. Now you have these multiple different ways to select a projection. So you can do spherical, which is basically the image is mapped as if it's wrapped around a sphere or a ball. Cylindrical, which basically means it is mapped as if it is wrapped around a cylinder. And then perspective, which I've never used and I've been told that it's, it's good for, I guess, like real estate photography or maybe architectural or buildings, things where there's very straight lines because that's the ultimate goal of this type of projection is to keep straight lines straight. So it's not super, super important for landscape photography that I have found, but let's just run through a couple of these. So if I hit spherical and let's just hit merge. And you can see that it is creating the panorama there and it just finished it and let's open this up. So this is what it looks like in spherical. So now let's go back here again. Let's highlight these, right click. We're gonna come down to photo merge, panorama, and let's hit cylindrical and let's merge that together. And here is that image right now. So you'll really be able to see the difference of these two when we bring them both up on screen. So this is cylindrical here. And this is spherical here, spherical here. And if you look at them, you can kind of tell, like if you imagine that this one right here on the left is wrapped around a cylinder, and this one right here would be wrapped around the ball. So that's kind of where the naming convention comes from. But you can definitely see the difference in the two here. So now let's go back here and let's crop these. So we want to obviously get rid of the area of white here. So I'm going to come up here to the develop module. Let's hit the crop tool and turn that off. Let's come over here and just bring this down to there. I'm gonna do this quickly too, to respect everyone's time. I'll bring this up to there. And this rock here is very, very important to this overall photograph. So bring that to there. So I really wanna try and capture as much of that as I possibly can. And we'll bring this into about right here. And that looks pretty good. Now let's go to the other one. So come up here to crop, bring this down. like that we'll bring this over and bring this over to there i got to come over a little bit further to about right there i think looks pretty good and that's about as much leeway as i can give on the rock in this perspective here let's hit enter and let's go back and let's look at these two i should say compare these two so come up here to the grid and we'll right click on these, hit the shortcut key, and for survey mode, and here is the difference. So this right here is the one that is spherical, and this is cylindrical. And you can almost see the difference between the two. The, the spherical almost looks, I guess, a little bit more realistic. It's more kind of stretched out. And the cylindrical one definitely has more of a, everything kind of looks like it's pushed together a little bit more. I think they both look good. And the interesting thing is, is if I wasn't comparing both of these on the screen right now, you really wouldn't be able to see a difference. Like you, if you saw one of those photographs at face value, you'd be like, oh wow, that, it looks great. But the biggest difference to me is that in this version here, the mountains kind of look a, a little bit, a little bit taller. And then the rock down here has a little bit less breathing room around it than right here. And that's a very, very important aspect of this. So let's go back up here to the other aspects of uh, pano. So I'm going to come over here to photo merge, panorama. And I think that in most cases, I don't want to say all cases, but most cases, sphere spherical 
I'll probably struggle saying that the entire video, but the spherical is usually the best route to go, usually in landscape photography, but I would definitely not just go ahead and just automatically hit spherical every time. Definitely kind of run through that same exercise. Go to spherical, go to cylindrical, put a crop on it, compare them, and see which one you like better, because there are some scenarios where I think cylindrical works better than spherical. Now, a couple more important things to note here. So you have this boundary warp, and what boundary warp does is basically it's gonna stretch out the sides to ultimately consume that area of white. So bring this over, let's switch this to spherical, leave it on boundary warp 100, and you can see what that has done. So it's gonna take all those areas away. But let me go ahead and hit merge here, just so you can see exactly what's happening. So I believe it is this one right here. Let me just say, yep, pano three. So you can see now that it kind of stretched things out all along the sides. And around here, it always looks pretty good, like around the sky area or maybe water. The boundary warp does a pretty good job, but sometimes when there's a lot of detailed areas of an in image, it can kind of look a little bit wonky. And if I zoom in here, you can, whoops, if I zoom into this area here, you can kind of see where things got a little, a little off, it looked like. Over here, I think it did a pretty good job, but all in all, it did okay. But the most important thing to know here is look how much additional room is around this rock now. And that's where that boundary warp really came in because it basically took the, the edges or the boundaries of the photograph and just kind of stretched it out to consume that white area. So you didn't really have to crop it. And the boundary warp worked really well around all this snow because there's not a lot of detail in here. So you really can't even see that. So it worked pretty good in that scenario. Now let's come up here. Highlight all three, right click, photo merge, panorama again, and let's hit cylindrical. And let's take that boundary warp to 100 and merge this one. And for this one, the amount of space around that rock in the foreground should be substantially even larger than any of the other previous versions of the panorama we've done. I believe that is this one right here. Yep, pano four. And look how much additional room is here. But now you can see what it did here. It actually this is this was not here this little twig and it basically uh, i don't know if it, i don't know the wizardry that lightroom uses maybe some kind of content aware fill more than likely to kind of fill in some of those empty areas but nevertheless it did an okay job there the sides look okay it's nothing it's not perfect but it, it looks pretty good but you can see how much additional area is around all of the edges of the photograph so that definitely helps in scenarios where you have to, an area that's a little bit tight for cropping, which is what that rock is. And um, I said that really weird. That is the scenario that this panel has is that that rock in the foreground is very, very important. I couldn't go back any further. I didn't have a wider lens. So that's really why I ended up using a panel. And I, the area around that stone was so tight. So I had, wanted to make sure I really experimented with a lot of these different panel settings in order to create as much breathing room around that rock in the foreground, because if the area, if the breathing room around that rock is too tight, I think it just messes up this whole photograph. So now let's go over here, right click, go to photo merge panorama again. And we've done spherical, we've done cylindrical, we've had the boundary warp all the way up. And you don't always have to take the boundary warp to 100. You can take it to 50 and then crop in the rest. It's totally up to you. But that's exactly what that boundary warp does. Some images it works very well on, others it doesn't work at all on. Now, fill edges. Now, this is something that I find personally usually does not work very well, and I'll show you why. So what it's doing is basically we're not using the boundary warp, but it's going to fill those edges, all that white area, with you know what it thinks is a great replacement. And it's using that same kind of like spot healing or content aware to find a sample to place in those white areas. So let's leave it on cylindrical, and we'll put fill edges, and we'll hit merge. And this is definitely one of those things you want to be on the lookout for. I, I actually avoid this, this tool. I, I, I never use fill edges. I'll use the boundary warp from time to time, but the fill edges I, I very rarely ever do for this main reason here. Let me find this one. Yep, Pano 5. So if we come over here, look at this. It actually took an area of the shoreline here and put it up here. You got all kinds of weird ghosting over here. It's got, well, it put a house in the mountain and actually took the house from here and put it up here in the mountain, which is obviously not where it goes. So it did not do good on that side. If we come all the way to the right side, I saw this already. Look at this mountain it put up in the clouds. So you can, I'm sure that there's like, they copied this area from here. That definitely doesn't look very realistic. So the, the fill edges definitely does not work well in either scenario, spherical or cylindrical. I'm not gonna do it again in, uh, in spherical because it's gonna basically give us the same result. I'm gonna come up here again to these three, 
right click photo merge whoops panorama and then you also have auto settings which i never really do auto settings is basically just using lightroom's auto adjustment settings just to kind of uh, edit the photo how it feels is the best way i always want to edit the photos myself so i never use edit settings and a cool thing to note is when you when you import a raw file to create a panorama, it also exports the, uh, I shouldn't say export, it stitches the images together also in a raw file. I'll show you in just a second, but actually I'll just show you right now. So these are all the panos we created. These, this is some of the raw files we started with. See, that's a raw file right here at the top. And here's one of the panos. Whoops. Oh, I still have them highlighted, that's why. Here's one of the panos, DNG. More panos DNG. So that's really a cool thing to note that they are all still going to be raw files. So you don't have to think that you have to edit the files before you create the pano. You can just import them completely raw, stitch the pano together, and then edit it afterwards. So I never use edit, edit auto. I, just, I never use auto settings. I always want to edit it myself. And then auto crop. I never use auto crop either because basically what's going to happen is Lightroom is going to crop that photograph just using some type of machine learning as to, you know, what, what kind of crop fits best, but it doesn't take into account your image. It doesn't really take into account your composition either, or your, your end creative goal of what you want that image to look like. And look at what it did to the rock here. It completely cut that off. So I always want to crop these photographs myself. So for this particular image here, let's do cylindrical. Let's take this boundary warp to say maybe 80. And I think that that probably looks pretty good right there. And if you did want to use fill edges here, I think that this is the scenario where you could use it is if you use that boundary warp to consume as much of that white area, uh, not as possible, but you can see that we, we pushed it really, really far up. So the area that it would have to fill in is very, very small. See what it did there? That area was small versus if we had this boundary warp all the way to zero, the area that it would have to fill in is massive. And that's kind of where it gets sideways real quick. So I'm going to take the boundary warp to about 80. We'll hit fill edges. Let's go ahead and merge this together and see how this did. And here it is right here. Yep. Pano six. And if we look at the edges here, you can see that it did a little bit better job. There's no houses in the mountains or anything like that. It does look a little muddy over here. So what I would do is come up here to develop, bring down the crop tool, and let's just bring this side in just a touch to, to kind of remove that area. And everything else looks good. There's no floating mountains in the sky here. This area looks good as well. And let's go ahead and close this down. And I think that this is starting to look better. And what's crazy is look how much room we have around this rock right here. So much foreground room. It looks fantastic. So we could actually bring this up a little bit if we don't need that much to something about right there, but that is starting to definitely look good. So if you do want to use the, what was it called? The fill edge, let me go back of your photo merge panorama. Yeah, the fill edges. I would recommend taking that boundary warp up quite a bit, maybe somewhere around 75 or 80, so that uh, all Lightroom has to do is just fill in a very small area. But as you can tell, we just went through pretty much all the potential options for panos. And I think it's important to go through all these. I've seen a lot of, um, of information out there on panorama, panorama photography, and it always kind of points to do, the, do this, do this, and do this, and then, and then you're done. But I think it's important to really understand all the different available options to you because I don't think that there is a one-size-fits-all scenario for panos. I don't think spherical works the best 100% of the time. Sometimes cylindrical works. Sometimes fill edges work. Sometimes boundary warp works. There's a multiple different ways to do it. So I would definitely experiment a little bit, but I hope kind of running through all of those in this particular scenario is something that helped you feel a little bit, little bit more comfortable with the different settings inside of Lightroom to stitch a pano together. And as you can tell in this photograph that uh, Lightroom did a really good job putting it all together. And I find that Lightroom most of the time does a good job stitching these panos together. So in something I want to mention real quick, I think this video is running longer than normal, but I do want to show you this because it's a, a technique that is not often done inside of, or with, with panos is using a telephoto lens. Most of the time people use panos, they either do it in a horizontal or maybe a vertical orientation, but they use a wide angle lens and then sweep to the left, to the right. 
but putting on a telephoto lens and zooming in a little bit gives you a total different perspective and it doesn't have to create a very small or narrow field of view. You can create a pano like that as well. So here are some of the images I captured with my 100 to 200. And as you can see, this is the one on the left, right, and in this, I'm sorry, left, center, right. I'm gonna hit escape here. Let's highlight all three of these photographs. Right click and, whoops, photo merge, panorama. It's gonna create the panorama preview. I are, I've already done this one and spherical worked the best, I think, for this one. And since the area that it needs to fill is very, very small, I'm just gonna go ahead and just hit fill edges just for uh, speed purposes and then hit merge. What's, and what's really cool is once this is done, I'll, you'll be able to see this scene zoomed in, and this same scene is in the other scene that I took that we've been working on for the, uh, the panel as well, and it's kind of cool just to see those different perspectives. Okay, it looks like it just finished, and there it is right there. So now it stitched everything together. You can see it did a really good job. Everything looks pretty clean, no issues anywhere. And what's really neat is if I compare this with let's just pick one of these that we pan out earlier this one shortcut key in this scene on the right this telephoto pano is this right here this area in the background so as you can see how kind of small and how it's just kind of lost in this overall scene but i love the the, the clouds back here i love the light that was happening and i just zoomed all the way in and created this pano so totally different perspective but this image is right there inside of this image so Tons of different ways to create panos, tons of different ways, I should say a ton, multiple different ways to stitch them together. And I hope that information was helpful. So if you don't do any kind of panoramic photography next time you're on location, def definitely give it a whirl, test it out. It's a fantastic technique to get more comfortable with, just like focus stacking or exposure blending. And I hope that this video made you feel more co comfortable, not only with how to do it on location, but also how to stitch them together inside of Lightroom, along with some of the mistakes you want to avoid as well. Any questions related to uh, anything, honestly, please leave those in the comment section below and I'll get back in touch with you as soon as I possibly can. And if you enjoyed this week's video, if you could give it a thumbs up, subscribe to the channel if you're not subscribed already. And I'm sorry it went a little bit longer. I have no idea. Hopefully it is under, uh, I don't know, maybe 30 minutes. Uh, I've never created a video that long. I really hope it's under 30 minutes. I have no idea right now. But either way, I hope it was helpful and uh, I do appreciate you carving out a little bit or a lot of time in this week's uh, scenario to spend it with me and I will see you all next Wednesday. Bye.